Our next speaker is Colin McDonald. Colin is Chief Executive of the Department of Internal Affairs, Secretary for Internal Affairs, Secretary for Local Government and Chief Information Officer in New Zealand. He is the ICT Function Leader for Government, working uh, collaboratively across the state sector to transform government ICT to support radically transformed public services. He's also responsible for the success of the New Zealand Government's Better Public Services Result 10 initiative, which strives to improve citizens' digital interaction with government. Colin presented at the New Zealand seminar last year. Uh, unfortunately, he was unable to join us here in Canberra in person, but we have his permission to screen the presentation. So let's welcome. Thank you, Colin. In a mana in a reo in a row rangatirama tenakoto tenakoto tenatato katua. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'd, I'd also like to add my welcome to the welcomes that have been given before. I'd like to pay particular uh, acknowledgement to my fellow panel members. And I'd also like to acknowledge my fellow vocalist, um, Bill McNaught. Uh, those of you who were at the Leanza conference earlier in the week may have experienced a, a kind of strange event of two imports getting up and singing Scottish songs in front of a bunch of librarians who were, who, who were showing their appreciation. Um, Bill and I are not related, by the way. Look, I'm, I'm here to talk about um, digital citizenship from the, from the perspective of government, uh, and it's very much a personal view. These are my thoughts. This is not, this is not government policy. Um, I'm sure I won't contravene uh, government policy, but the, 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 these are my personal views about digital citizenship, what it means, where it's heading, and why it's important. And, and I guess fundamentally, the, the proposition is that digital citizenship will ultimately be about trust um, and, and will ultimately be one of the core underpinnings of the ongoing relationship between the citizen and the state. Now, trust, uh, be before, maybe before I do that, I'll just expand a little bit on my role as Government Chief Information Officer. Um, the, the, the Minister did describe it extremely well, but I do want to point out that I don't have access to everybody's information, um, nor do I steward all of the information across government. Fundamentally, the role is about how we more effectively use information technology, and that clearly has a big information element. Um, but the role isn't to steward all of the government's uh, information. I mention that because when you take that kind of thought and add it to this title of internal affairs, in different parts of the world you end up in a different place about what that might mean. Uh, and our citizenship people do often say that many of our, our, um, our residents who want to become citizens are quite worried when they hear that internal affairs is coming to call. In other countries, it has quite a different connotation. Uh, and, and it is an interesting, you know, I do think it's important to frame the conversation within that, within that construct. Because government has coercive power. Uh, we cede power to government, and we cede it in ways that we expect to reflect our expectations as citizens. And we cede that power because in a civilized society, we expect rules, we expect people to behave in particular ways, we expect standards to be upheld, we expect our fellow citizens to behave in particular ways, and, and we cede some of that authority to government to help govern us and look after us. And in, within that, that coercive power um, dynamic is, of course, raises concerns about the misuse of power. Uh, and the imbalance of power between citizens and governments. Uh, and so anytime somebody stands up and talks about information in a government context, I think there's always a need to acknowledge that information isn't always seen as a positive thing. It can be seen as quite a, a, negative, a, a negative thing, and a thing that can cause citizens concern about what is happening with my information. Um, what is government doing with it? What is the private sector doing with my information? Uh, and and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about, I think, the direction of travel that technology is taking us down and both the risks and the benefits that technology brings. So my contention is that trust in government is paramount. It's a very important relationship and it's influenced by many elements. Um, and and I'm, look, I'm not, a, I'm not an academic, I'm a pragmatist. Um, that would be the best label for me. But when I, when I take a look at it and look at the studies that have been done into 
into what underpins trust with government. There are, there are these, broadly speaking, these six factors that people tend to take into account when they think about what, const what, what will detract from or what will improve trust in government. Um, and when people trust government, they're more likely to contribute, so they're more likely to vote, they're more likely to access the services that they're entitled to, they're more likely to meet their obligations to society through government, um, so they're more likely to pay their taxes, they're more likely to pay their road user charges uh, and pay their licensing fees. When trust breaks down, you know, it, it might feel like a very long bow to, to go from New Zealand to Tunisia or Egypt or the Ukraine, where there have been significant breakdowns um, in, in civil society. And we can sit in New Zealand and I think we can justifiably feel very proud of the, of the history that we have in terms of the, the level of trust in government. Our government is one of the most trusted governments in the world. That is an incredibly privileged and valuable position to hold. And it's one that I personally think is very important that we continue to focus on and maintain. In the OECD, on average, the kind of level of trust in government sits at about 40%. So there's a kind of, people are, people are having a, as we would say in Scotland, they're having a bob each way. They're not quite sure whether they trust government or they don't government. In New Zealand, our stats are interesting because if you ask a kind of generic question, about perceptions of trust in government. And this is done through the Kiwi, Kiwis Count survey, which is quite an interesting source of, of general information that I would, I would um, suggest, if you're interested, you take a look at. The perceptions of trust in government sit at about 42%, so they sit at around the OECD average. When you ask people a slightly different question, when you ask them the question, what is your experience of trust, then that goes up to 78%. Now, I find that a really interesting stat, and I'm sure some of you will have thought about why that might be, um, but I just find it curious that, that there's a generic feeling of, mm, I'm having a bob each way, but there's a personal experience of, you know, I'm feeling pretty good about this, 78% is, is pretty high. So when you think about what government can do, there are hard levers and soft levers that government can pull and deploy um, through policies, through action, through service, and through focus. So all of those things that we have up there are things that government um, can, in fact, influence and can make some choices on. So as I thought about that in a digital context, of course, I'm going to think about technology. That's both my background, my predisposition, but it's also the world we're in. As the minister said, our worlds have changed quite dramatically in the last five years. And I've been, I've been involved in technology uh, since my very first lecture at Glasgow University in, in 1977, which is, that gets scarier every time I say it. Such a long time ago, and yes, there were computers, and they were teaching technology in 1977. So when I look back over my career in technology, I can't find a period where there has been change at this pace. And, and that's, that's not just me. If you actually look at the pace of change and you look at the, the various graphs, then the pace of change is accelerating. But for me, the thing that has made the difference is in fact this, this device. It's the smartphone, the processing power of the smartphone, its usability combined with the ubiquity of connection to the internet and therefore to information and therefore to the world. It, there's, a, there's three or four things have come together there that I think have made this um, the most um, interesting time in the way technology can influence society. And there's no question that technology can help with those issues of trust because technology can definitely support greater democracy. You know, technology can challenge the whole idea of representative democracy. You could move, you could think about moving towards a much more direct form of democracy. Again, this is my personal view, this is not government policy. Um, but you could do that, and some countries are, are sort of putting their toes in the water of that quite seriously around various referenda, various other methods of polling citizens and getting citizens to contribute directly to the decision-making process. So it can enable easier engagement 
easier flow of information. It can deliver better public services. And we'll, I'll talk a little bit more about what we're doing in that area. And it can create different models of operating. But it can also produce risks to trust. It doesn't take too many privacy breaches for people to get concerned about the use of government data and how well government is holding and stewarding our data. And, and what's interesting, because I've been quite heavily involved in, in privacy breaches over the last few years, and in fact, as a result of the MSD kiosk issue, ran a programme across all of the, public, uh, all of the government's um, public-facing systems to lift standards of security and privacy because we recognised that that was a serious issue that had to be addressed. And I'm pleased to say that very significant improvements um, have taken place as a result of that. But I still can't guarantee to ministers that there will not be another security uh, or privacy breach. And I'll never be able to do that, and I was never able to do that in the past. Before computers existed, I would not have been able to do that in the past because information can always get into the wrong hands. Mistakes can and will be made. And the issue is how do we manage that? How do we do our best to prevent, but then how do we manage it when it happens? Because I think the citizens, are, I think the citizens of the country are prepared to accept that things do go wrong, but they want to know that the government is taking those issues very seriously. So how do we get the balance right? How do we get this balance between between access and privacy and security. Because citizens' expectations are changing. We know they're changing because we're all experiencing that. You know, I, can't, I couldn't think now about going overseas and not going online to book something. You know, to book a train journey in, in, in the UK. In fact, I'm just about to go overseas and I'll be booking my train journey from Leeds to London online. Five years ago, I wouldn't have been able to do that. Now, if I can't do it, I'll feel that something seriously terrible has, has gone on. So our expectations are changing. We expect more to be available to us online when we want it, how we want it. And this isn't just the young generation. You know, it isn't just those, you know, those young people. I was sitting there earlier on thinking about, you know, we, we, we do think about the digital citizens and, and the word literate. We think about the youth of today and we complain about how, you know, this terrible use of, um, of bad grammar and spelling and all the rest of it. And I was sitting there thinking, gosh, I can remember when I was the youth of today. And my parents and society were saying things like that about me. And they were definitely saying it about Bill and he's now the National Librarian. I mean, <laughs> isn't it amazing? We were the youth of today. I don't think there's any difference between the youth of today now and the youth of today then. So, so the idea that, that, that these expectations are just in the youth, I think, is, is, is a fallacy and is a dangerous one. We've been doing quite a lot of research on what constitutes a, a, a quality government service in a, digital, in, in a digital environment. And it's very clear from that research that citizens want services built around their needs. They want, to, they want to achieve something in their own lives when they're dealing with government. They don't deal with government because they want to. Now, I know that's pretty obvious. People don't actually want to have a passport just to have a passport. They want a passport so they can travel. I know that's obvious, but sometimes we just kind of forget those obvious things. They, they, you know, they don't want to do a police check. They want to successfully get a job. All of those things are interactions with government, so they want them easy. They want them part of the process. They don't want it to be a separate thing. So fundamentally, they want to be able to transact with government when they need to on their terms based around the events that are happening in their lives. And they're very much searching for ways to make their life admin more and more straightforward. So the role of government, I think, in that context starts to change because if citizens' expectations are becoming very focused on their lives and what they're doing and what matters to them, then we're starting to move into the world of personalized government services. And it's no different to what happened and has been happening in the private sector. I had the pleasure of working for ANZ for many years, just shortly after we emigrated. And, and ANZ was very much focusing on how do you produce personal services through impersonal means? Because we can't afford we can't charge enough to our customers to give everybody a personal banker. 
But we do want to give them a personalized service, and the way to personalize service is through data and information and technology. It's the only way that we can sustainably provide those tailored services. So the government's role, I, I think, and again, this is a personal view, it starts to shift, and government starts to become a platform upon which many players can come in and provide services in a privacy-protected, secure manner with the control sitting with citizens, the decision sitting with citizens to access those services in that way. And government then remains also, as well as the platform provider, government has to be the provider of basic services for all. For everybody who wants the basic service, you can have it. But if you would like fries with that, or if you'd like to do that in a particular way, here's an app that somebody's provided. And that app may be free or it may be charged. That's, that, that's not really the issue. The issue is there's choice and choice available to people because that's what citizens are expecting. And if we are unable to move the, 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 the experience of citizens working with their government to a space that looks much more like the rest of our lives, my contention is that will undermine trust in government because we will be seen as being inefficient, not effective, and not focused on citizens' needs. There's some great examples across the world of, of, of countries doing this. Singapore is a really, really strong example of a government that's focusing very hard on how to use technology to serve citizens better. And if I had more time, I'd go into some, uh, some examples for you. But I haven't. And I did warn Corin that once I get started, it's hard to stop me. And he's, I don't know whether he's twitching or saying... Not twitching just yet, but he's, he's, he's in that pre-twitch phase. So, so look, I'll, I'll, I'll look to kind of try and tie things up and wrap things up. So I don't have a crystal ball, um, but, but I do think about the future. And I think about where is this heading and how does government need to position itself? There's no question in my mind that technology will continue to, to change. Uh, I mean, I've, the, the word evolve doesn't quite sound quick enough. Uh, because if the speed of change is going to continue to accelerate, then the last five years will be nothing compared to the next five years compared to the next five. So if that trend continues, my brain can't cope with where that might take us. But it does mean that technology will continue to evolve. It'll continue to become more powerful. Um, and, and with power comes risk. But it will continue to be more powerful. Citizens' expectations will continue to change. And my, kind of, my model is that, that government has to be a fast follower. I think, I think it's, it, it gets quite difficult for government to be a leader in that space in terms of citizen services. But we have to be a fast follower. So as Air New Zealand and ANZ and Foodstuffs and all of the major retailers bring new, service and, new services and new ways of operating to their customers, government has to be in behind emulating those services, being, providing similar experiences to those, to those uh, approaches, because that's what you will start to expect, and that's what we will start to expect. So it means that government has to be agile. You don't often hear those two words in the same sentence, unless not is stuck in there. Government is not thought of as being agile. And look, partly that's the nature of government. And, and that's, that's um, you know, I, in, my, in my system development days, when we found a bug in the software, we'd occasionally say, oh, it's okay, that's actually a feature. We meant it to be like that, particularly, I think, if you worked for Microsoft. I, I didn't, don't, don't quote me. Um, but government hasn't been agile, and actually, at times, that's a good thing. Agility in government, governments making rapid, fast changes can be actually quite dangerous for societies. But in terms of services, the provision of services, my contention is government has to become more agile which means that you and I have to be prepared for there to be the odd, the odd stumble. The odd little service that goes out there that doesn't quite meet needs has to get modified and withdrawn. Because in the end, and, and I guess my last comment is straight back, coming right back to my first comment, I believe that no matter how those things and expectations change, trust remains vital. Trust remains a fundamental underpinning of democratic societies. And democracy might not be fantastic, but it's the best, it's better than all of the alternatives. So I'd quite like us to keep it. Um, and trust is fundamental, I think, to keeping democracy fresh and keeping democracy alive. Thank you.